All right, welcome back everyone. I appreciate you stopping by to uh, interact with uh, some of the things we're gonna talk about today. And there's a lot of good questions lined up. And of course, anything that I say is not meant to replace uh, any type of chemical synthetic, you know, drugs for something more natural that has less side effects. So just check with your doctor before making that substitution. God forbid. All right, Steven. All right. Well, we're really excited uh, and honored to have our first guest out of the green room. It's uh, uh, Julian, and she is one of the many hardworking hospice nurses that does such a tough task. And so we're glad to have her on. Hang on just a moment, uh, Julian. Let me bring... You mean Carrie, right? I'm sorry. Carrie. Yeah. Stand by, Carrie. And I've really botched this up because I didn't even unmute you. So, Carrie, stand by a minute, and I'm going to fashion this uh, shot for you including, uh, let's see, Dr. Berg, forgive me for doing that. What did I do wrong? I tell you what, Carrie, I'm not quite sure what's wrong with your shot, but please go ahead with your question for Dr. Berg. Okay, no problem. Hi, Dr. Berg. Um, hi. Hi, I've been following you for quite a while, and um, I must say everything you talk about, I, I pretty much learned in college uh, genetics and molecular genetics, so I appreciate you. Um, I do have a question. I um, have recently started menopause about, oh, maybe six months ago. And um, I've noticed that losing weight um, feels impossible. Um, in fact, I've tried everything I've tried in the past, um, cutting, cutting calories, cutting down carbs, fasting. I mean, I've, I've tried it all. And I can't seem to um, get the ball rolling. And I wondered if you had any advice for me. So do you, um, where do you tend to hold the weight? Is it more in the stomach or the hips or the butt? What, what where does it yep. tend to accumulate? Uh, lower stomach, hips, thighs, mm -hmm. that area. Okay. So, um, do you, did you, um, have you been doing keto before that, uh, before menopause or just kind of like after menopause? I just recently started um, after watching you, I started the healthy keto. I actually started the uh, OMAD. Um, and I find that, you know, by the end of the day, I'm starving. Um, mm. So it's really hard to, you know, just have a salad. So uh, that tells me right there that somehow I don't think you're in ketosis for some weird reason. Um, do you, um, can you give me a little bit more information on like um, what you would eat and how, how many meals a day? Um, well, I've been trying to do one meal a day. Um, mm -hmm. I've been trying the sauerkraut. Uh, last night I had the sauerkraut. I had some hot dogs on it. Um, the night before I had um, a hamburger with a big salad. Um, I just find that later in the night I'm craving sweets. Um, it might be from a habit that I used to do. I used to kind of snack into the night. Um, but it just feels harder than it should. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, here's the thing. Um, did you go right from multiple meals just to that one meal a day? Yep. Yeah. Okay. And how long did you do it for till you, you said, well, this is a bit too difficult? Probably about four days. Um, yeah. and then I, and then I tried a prolonged fast. I, I fasted for about four days. Um, I'm kind of an all or none person, so right. I don't like, I'm not very patient. So I'll just, you know, challenge myself as hard as I can. Um, but I, I'm feeling defeated right now. Yeah. Um, and just, I don't know where to go. So I'm going to, I'm going to, I want to switch your goal for uh, a moment. And, um, okay. The first goal, let's just, uh, have the first goal being getting rid of the appetite. In other okay. words, get to a point where you can do this and you're like, wow, I can go long periods of time without an appetite. I have no more cravings. That is your first goal because that is based on like, let's get healthy, lose weight, not lose weight to get healthy. Um, and so you're, you're really up against uh, probably years of um, insulin resistance. And so it's like, even what happens is like, even though you're not eating sugar, your liver is uh, in this excessive uh, gluconeogenesis. It's making sugar from other things. And so here you are like, what is going on? I shouldn't be going through this. Um, and then, so how do we do that? Um, I would do two meals a day and I would add a little bit of a uh, little bit more fat with the meals. Uh, yes, that's right. More fat, saturated fat. I would add a little, maybe butter. And, um, I would add 
um, other things with, with meat fat. Why? Because um, menopause, uh, you have this shift from your ovaries that are gone in retirement now to the adrenal glands, which are the raw materials, cholesterol. We need to, to, to build up more of those uh, hormones that your adrenals now have to take over the slack. So that'll actually, the, the extra fat's going to help um, with the satisfying you, allowing you to go longer without eating. And then I would give it probably two, three, probably even four weeks to really let your body um, adjust and um, adapt to fat burning. Then you go to one meal a day and then watch what happens. And it'll be like, wow, now my body's uh, really in ketosis. And you could probably even get a, a test to make sure you're you're in ketosis. And then you can, um, you know, add, add some exercise to that and it, it goes stronger ketosis. But I think just the transition just needs to be tweaked a little bit more. And, um, especially if you had a history of doing this with sweets, um, does that make sense? It does. It just, I lost a whole bunch of weight about six years ago just by cutting my calories and carbs and it's not working this time around. Yeah. So, yeah, this happens with a lot of women that goes go through menopause, and um, it's like a whole different um, condition. And um, so, I think I think um, the fact that you still crave sweets mm -hmm. and still hungry tells me just you're you're not quite in ketosis yet. Now, why would that be? Well, because the adrenals need some more support, and that okay. needs to be focused on first. So. Okay. Um, um, because I will tell you this, the results will come once you don't have, when you're in ketosis. And how do we know that? Well, you have no, you're not hungry anymore. <laughs> okay. So Thank that's you. kind of like, yeah, you're welcome. Try that. I think, uh, just shift your focus and then watch what happens. And then one more point, um, some of the superficial fat is called subcutaneous fat, which is different than the visceral fat. Um, it works a little bit differently in that you have to really add a lot more exercise to this. So of course, don't omit that as well. Well, that's terrific. Well, uh, Carrie, um, I want to come in here for a second because Dr. Berg will attest that I have one of the weakest constitutions on the planet. I have calluses on my left hand from hanging on the refrigerator door. It's just awful. And yet I'm not hungry right now. And I won't think of eating until three o'clock. And my weak point is Carrie, uh, you know, in the evening, I'm more inclined. Once I eat something, then the engine begins a little bit and I'm hungry. But I don't feel like food at all right now. But my mantra is nothing after six, Steve. Nothing after six. Well, I'm hungry, I know. So eat tomorrow. Have a blast. You know, eat those great <laughs> things. Nothing after six. And the weight falls off me. And, the, and more importantly than that, once I've come to that discipline, it's not hard. After a lifetime of freezer burn, lean cuisines, and misery trying to lose weight, Intermittent fasting in particular is fantastic. And I, I haven't been the best, um, you know, keto guy, but there's no question. A simple thing is don't eat two cups of sugar a day, Steve, and I guarantee you, you'll feel better. So low carbs, and I, I, I may not meet the mark exactly, but low carbs and um, intermittent fasting one meal a day or maybe two within a two hour, three hour window. But, but you know, it's just a life changer for me. And I've been down about 45 pounds for the last three years. Uh, uh, thanks to Dr. Berg's uh, constant discipline uh, on me and, and saying, you want to stay on the show? Well, you bet. No, I'm kidding. But he's very, uh, just, <laughs> <laughs> he says, I don't want any, yeah, anyway. But listen, that's it. So Carrie, uh, have faith, keep going. And once you get that squared away, you are going to absolutely love life uh, on um, OMAD and, and keto and so on. So trust the process. All right, and Steve, Steve, I'm doing, I'm going to do a, um, I'll release a video on another uh, slightly related topic because um, as I'm getting into the DNA testing, even myself, like I have this, there's a, there's this kind of a sweet tooth gene that um, I have a problem with. So I, if I start, it's over. I can't just do one. It's like, I have to do the whole thing and, um, and then keep going and keep going. So as long as I don't start. And so I just, I don't, I don't give in to things anymore because I don't have the cravings, but uh, I am, I have a tendency to uh, overdo it big time. And so, um, which is very ironic because uh, if you compare back then to now, it's like a whole different person. 
Yeah, well, we are kindred souls in that uh, in that regard. Okay, let's kick off an exciting question. Oh, wait a minute, uh, Doc. Let me go to something else because I didn't load that. I'm really getting F today for uh, being ready for the show. So let's go to social media. Barbara from YouTube, please discuss the importance of food combination when eating. What are the bad combinations and what are the best combinations, if that makes sense? You know, honestly, it's like... Um with this, you, you can combine any way you want because we're not adding the grains and we're not, it's not about food combining. That's not the important factor. But if you wanted to know what would be the worst combination would be to add each sugar and protein or sugar and fat together because you're going to get something called glycation, which is um, uh, the, the kind of the binding of this protein and this uh, making it very unavailable to you and really creating um, going right into the diabetic type thing. So, and that creates a lot of damage in all your tissues, the arteries, the brain, the eye, it's all about glycation. So that would be the worst. Uh, so what combinations would that be? Let's see what has sugar and fat ice cream, um, which I used to have every night before bed, whole thing of Ben and Jerry's. Uh, then what about, um, sugar and protein barbecued ribs? So those are, those are two things that are really bad. Um, but you can actually add vegetables or salad with, with meat. How about that? That's a good combination. And uh, so as long as your carbs are low, you can do any combination you want. All right. We're all queued up with the questions. And here's the first one, Doc. Okay. Which vegetable is highest in quercetin? I'm glad you uh, read that. I didn't know how to pronounce it. So the highest uh, in quercetin. All right. Let's go back to social media. Uh Ingrid, uh, from Facebook, I lost 40 pounds on keto. Thanks to all your advice. Question. Oh, that just jumped up. Let's see. Uh, question. Because of our female hormones, boy, we just talked about that. Should we come off keto for a bit or just a day and then get back on? Hmm. <clears throat> There's this false information about you should cycle through carbs. Like for some reason, like if you eat carbs, then you'll reset something where it'll be beneficial. Listen, you've already been doing that probably your whole life and that has not been successful. I can't think of even one reason why you should cycle through and go back to, <clears throat> go back to carbs. I mean, what, just to fill up your glycogen reserve? Well, what, what's that going to do? You, you probably already have enough glycogen. Um, it's you, when you actually go to low carb or even no carb, you still, uh, your body can still make sugar, uh, it, if it needs it because certain, a couple of tissues in your body do need a little sugar, but you don't have to, and you don't want to consume sugar, uh, to do that. So you want your body to make it. And, um, but there is no reason other than some arbitrary made up idea that we need to cycle through this sugar for some reason, which is, it's not, it's not, it's not, it's not a good thing. Uh, especially since you, as soon as you start that, now you're like, okay, now you next day your blood sugars are low and like, hmm, I need some more. So just a little bit of something will create more of that, that problem or more of that desire. Okay, well, let's talk about who is watching the show. Do we have any viewers? We certainly do. So we'd like to say good morning to all our viewers joining us today from the UK, Canada, Mexico, Jordan, Denmark, Algeria. Uh, Poland, Russia, Ghana, France, Morocco, Sweden, Nigeria, Lithuania, Switzerland, Serbia, Croatia, Austria, India, Italy, Japan, Ireland, Greece, Congo, uh, the Congo, Armenia, uh, I already said that, Oman, Oman, excuse me, Chile, Scotland, Iran, Norway, Qatar, uh, Pakistan, Belgium, the Netherlands, Finland, Uganda, Yemen, Azerbaijan, that caught me, Kenya, Iraq, Argentina, Germany, Australia, Egypt, the Virgin Islands, beautiful place, South Africa, Bermuda, Peru, Israel, Trinidad and Tobago, Taiwan, Jamaica, the Czech Republic, uh, Saudi Arabia, of course, and all across these United States, including Julian, who is one of our traveling sort of minstrels of health, and he's currently in uh, San Diego, and we're glad to have him back. And uh, Julian, if you would, uh, give us a 30-second intro and then let Dr. Berg dig into it. And Julian, you're on with Dr. Berg. Hey, nice to see you, Dr. Berg. I uh, appreciate all the research you share and do. I, let's see, I had a lot of questions. Um, recently, I did everything you mentioned about blood pressure. Um, I forgot the whole list, but the 
the arginine. I was curious if I have to take argin L arginine if I consume a lot of meat. And if um oh I, I stopped eating kale. Uh that worked. I, I my blood pressure came down. I would eat a pound of kale every time I eat, but I uh, just don't want to do that the rest of my life. Uh, it's very bloating. So I replaced it with a bunch of avocados and uh, cucumbers. I was, I was curious on your thought on those two, if that makes sense. Okay. Yeah. So I think, uh, I think, yeah, I hear you. It's like, there's, there's ours. You do have um, not very majorly high oxalates in kale, but there, there's some other anti-nutrients that some people just don't do well. Um, but um our L-arginine does tend to increase the uh, nitric oxide, which will help the arteries and blood pressure and things like that. But um, like, why couldn't you eat just a steak? Why couldn't you eat some animal product uh, and get that arginine? Because uh, that specific amino acid does compete with other amino acids. So it might not be selectively uh, absorbed like you want it to create that effect. So it's better to have it on an empty stomach and not with any other amino acid. Um, but then uh, you also said, uh, what about other types of vegetables, right? You're, uh, is it cucumber or something like that? Uh, yes, sir. I just do um, mostly, mostly avocado and then just oh, a whole yeah. cucumber. Yeah. Yeah. So you just got to find out what, what type of vegetables that don't bother you. And, um, um, you know, I think that's a good, good idea. But if you can just also over time experiment with more variety just to start putting a little bit of tension on feeding these, um, these microbes, um, a variety of fi- uh, things that have uh, vegetables that, um, that don't irritate you yet can actually um, give you more of like a diversified, you know, gut microbiome. Um, but again, I don't agree with some of this new functional fibers that they're coming out with and they're like synthetic fibers and they're like, Oh yeah, it's good for your gut health. Well, do we know that our microbes want synthetic fibers versus like fibers that come from food? Um, this is like a whole different field that creates a lot of bloating and gas in people. So especially when they get into the keto treats. My goodness. My, my goodness. It's, it's hilarious. Uh, my blood pressure went from maybe around 140 to around 120 over 80, which uh, I would like to get to 110 over 70 optimally but um as soon as i left the kale um it went back to 140 but it but the that diastolic stayed at 80 and, and the strangest thing I, I thought okay i'm eating like six avocados <laughs> you know what that's good that's that's actually normal that's normal your diastolic should be 80 because you don't want it actually too low because then um you won't have that pressure to push the blood around like you want it so you want it just like you know, roughly around 120 or 80. So um, I think you did the right thing. The fact that you, um, it affects your blood sugar, there could be some type of gut inflammation going on. So just be aware of the omega-6 fatty acids and the vegetable oils. Just watch out for those. They're in so many different things. Um, But uh, hey, thanks for coming on and uh, good to seeing you again. And um, enjoy the sunny weather in San Diego as we're freezing our butts off up here in the north. Yes, sir. Thank you, Jillian. Great to see you again. I tell you what, you ought to see Jillian. He's got these huge guns. He's in super shape. He lives in a van with his honey. And I don't know, but, you know, he's the real deal. So whatever he eats, he fine-tunes it, and he looks like uh, he's just the perfect specimen. He must do 100 push-ups every hour and that thing. But anyway, thank you for coming back on. And uh, who knows where we'll find Julian next. He's in San Diego currently, but he's kind of a nomad and travels all over and exhibits his great health for everyone he passes. Okay, let's... uh, Find out if we have some answers to our first quiz question, and in fact, we do with our lightning fast audience. The question was, which ve- excuse me vegetable is highest in quercetin? If I said that right, Doc, and forty uh, percent mm-hmm. say broccoli sprouts, twenty five percent say onions. I love them. Fifteen percent say cabbage, ten percent say leafy greens, and ten percent say cruciferous veggies. Okay, well, the answer is onions. Wow, onions have. Uh, very high levels. So um, onions um, can give you a lot of different benefits. uh, But this, this compound, this natural compound is also really interesting because it actually can help with allergies, asthma, it's anti-cancer, it's anti-inflammatory, it's antimicrobial. It'll also increase um, 
this hormone in men called luteinizing hormone. It's a pituitary hormone, which can then increase your testosterone. So, um, so stay tuned for more information on that. I will be releasing a video on that topic. Wonderful. Let's go back to social, social media. We'll just uh, give them all the love today. Uh, oh, wait a minute. A shout out to additional viewers joining us from Bulgaria, Tanzania, Somalia, Thailand, Singapore, Puerto Rico, Kuwait, Malta, and Romania. Wow. Is there any place left to talk about this morning? Okay. Yes. Judith, um, Judith from Facebook. You are amazing. Not me, Dr. Burke. She's talking about you, I think. Uh, I love your videos. Uh, you are so knowledgeable. Thank you. So thank you for that. Uh, You're welcome. Judith, that's wonderful. And let's see. We talked about the lady that lost 40 pounds. That's fabulous. Let's see. Uh, let's see. We already talked about that. Excuse me. So Bob from YouTube, I would like to know about your Keiko powder. Did I say that right? C-A-C-A-O? Keiko powder. If I use cacao it with... Powder. Cacao powder. Cacao powder. <laughs> cacao powder. Yeah, that's, that's it. Um, that's What's the that's the fat in um, chocolate, uh, chocolate cocoa bean, and um, so you know it's um, I, I don't know how many um, benefits that would have for health. I think it, um, I don't know. It could could have some benefits, but uh, it's um, it's good fat to use for various uh, keto desserts, and uh, um, I'm experimenting on cre creating these keto bricks using cacao powder and some whey protein and. Uh, uh, so far, um, boy, that's a chemical a chemistry project to have to get just right because um, at first it's like it tastes like a dog biscuit, and then now I put too much sweet in there, like some natural, you know, sweeteners, and then now it's too sweet. So I'm still working on it. Give me some time, and I will post that video. But uh, especially for people that uh, let's do they're on the run and they want to make their own bars because all these these new keto bars are just so filled with, again, those functional fibers, which I don't like, dextrin, corn fiber, tapioca fiber, that type of thing. Wow, well, speaking of fiber, I think he said, I wanna use it in lemon drink. Will it help me stop passing gas? And without being scientific, you will eventually explode if you don't uh, pass gas at some point. So is this gonna aid him in uh, uh, over flatulence? I don't know if it has that effect. Um, I'm not sure. Um, but since we're on the topic, um, I will mention, and w uh, when you ferment products, right? Let's say you're fermenting, you can even ferment meat, um, like in sausage and uh, those little sausage, uh, uh, what is it called? Like Slim Jims and that type of thing. You can, and they have to put some type of carbohydrate to feed the microbes. Um, so is that bad or good? Well, it really depends on what's left over after the microbes eat it. It's kind of like um, if you have kombucha tea and you're, it's, it's made with sugar. So the question is how much sugar is left over, uh, like two grams. So, well, that's definitely a lot better than other sweet drinks. But even with the, with the meats, um, there are some companies that are really increasing the ingredients, but they have to add some carb for that microbe. And so if, if you can get less than one gram, I think um, now we're in, in the ballpark where we can deal with that a lot easier. So it's not necessarily um, completely about the type of sugar. It's also about the amount of sugar too. So if you're just doing traces, um, then that's a lot better. Okay, very good. Here's a good question. Haley from Facebook, will your electrolyte powder break a fast? No, because there's hardly any calories to it. There's just minerals. Um, and uh, so you're not going to really break a fast. You're going to encourage someone to go longer because one of the problems with doing a fast is you're, if you're already going into a fast with deficiencies of minerals, then that can affect your, um, your electrolytes and you can have some issues with the heart and things like that. So um, that's one thing. And then the other thing is when you do fasting, you actually release a lot of water that's been retained. And so with the loss of the water comes a loss of electrolytes. So you do need a bit more potassium, magnesium, and even sodium when you start doing fasting, as well as the keto plan. Okay, very good. Uh, our first question of the day, which I missed, Miles from YouTube, can you help me with my keloid? Can fasting help heal it or eliminate it? I don't know. That's a, that depends on how big it is. I think it's going to improve it. Um, I would also add 
some good quality vitamin E oil to rub it into that keloid to help break down some of the scarring. Um, uh, there's another enzyme called um, seropeptase, which I don't know, the jury's still out that may create some positive things because that also helps you break down excessive um, like um, scarring and fibrosis in certain parts of your body. But these are just things to look at and just research more to see if that could work for you. Okay, very good. And Stephanie from YouTube, uh, like this question, where do you uh, start when trying to improve gut health? And maybe add to that, Doc, what do you do to screw it up? You start with the basics. Um, you experiment. Um, I Right on my website, it's like it's free. You just download the eat, an eating plan. Uh, plus, I have, if you could look under videos, the first video is start here, step one. And you start there. And then if you start to have bloating with the amount of greens that you eat, then you back off. But if you don't have the excessive bloating, then you can do, um, do that program and um, get some benefit from, from some of those vegetables. So that's how I would start it. Keep it simple. Um, and then you can modify it, but I, I lay out a really good high quality plan, uh, on the website and also my videos. So you can, um, at least, um, piggyback on years and years of trial and error and experience and experience of a lot of other people that have tried it and just the refining down to, you know what, this is going to work for the majority of people, not everyone, but, and then see if it works for you. Okay, if you want to start here, as Dr. Berg say, then you should start here. And that's by downloading his free app, which is good on uh, Android or Apple devices. So make sure you put that in your quiver of uh, weapons to assault all this stuff. Now, look what happens when you download that. I'm assuming that Alicia from Facebook uh, must have got the app and other things. Dr. Berg, you are saving my life. I am down 144 pounds since May 6, 2022. <laughs> I have 75 pounds to go. Thank you with several exclamation marks. So good for you, Alicia. That's a wow. wonderful story to hear. And uh, ain't it great? Okay, That's let's awesome. see. Um, Antoinette from YouTube. My sister has been diagnosed with diver diverticulitis. What would you recommend for her? Well, I, I don't know what she's eating and I don't have any additional information, but I will say if you have inflammation in your diverticuli, in your gut, I would probably do carnivore for a while. That way, uh, because we know uh, that the fiber can um, create some irritation down there. I don't believe that uh, the fiber has started the whole problem, but I think it left you with the inability to break down fiber. I think this, the whole problem starts uh, mainly by disrupting the microbiome. And one cause could be an antibiotic. Another cause could be omega six fatty acids and all the vegetable oils it can also be the sugar we eat, but, um, um, typically there has to be some pre-existing weakness within the gut. And then all of a sudden the whole chain reaction occurs. Okay. Very good. Now this next question is specifically for our producer, Terry Cornwell. And here it is. Okay. What is the most potent way to increase, uh, the growth of your brain cells? <laughs> Have hope, Terry. Okay, you want to grow your brain <laughs> because here's the thing. As we age, the brain does shrink, and that's called atrophy. And if a certain part of the brain shrinks too much, then we get cognitive problems. Uh, our mood changes. So what is the most, the most potent thing you can do to reverse that process and expand that brain to a normal brain, regrow it back to normal? Okay, very good. Get on that audience. And let's see, let's go back to social media. Um, oh, poor Colleen from Facebook. I have low ferritin and B12. What is the best way to increase them? Because my hair is falling out. So if we look at the question of um, iron and B12, which is related to anemia, your nails, the quality of hair, um, what food would have both iron and B12 and uh, it wouldn't be spinach. It would be red meat. Okay, red meat. You can also do liver. Um, but I would have a big, huge steak right now, and uh, you probably feel a lot better. Um, now, also realize that to help you absorb iron in B12, 
there also is a stomach component part that you need to acidify that stomach. That could be a part of the problem. So um, if you don't have like um, an ulcer or gastritis, then you can take betaine hydrochloride. If you do, then you need to heal the stomach um, with something like um, sulforaphane from broccoli sprouts or uh, maybe some, some zinc carnosine, things like that to actually heal it, then you you have to go from there. But I have done a lot of videos on this topic. You can dig into it and uh, learn all about it. Okay, very good. Next up from the green room is Karen, and she is from Ohio. Hi, Karen. Unmute yourself and go ahead with your question for Dr. Berg. Hi. Hello. Hi. Um, thank you for giving me this opportunity, and thank you for your dedication to this work. Um, I started keto last March and in the first eight months, I lost 60 pounds, Wow! but two months in to this, I, um, was diagnosed with an autoimmune condition called bolus pimphigoid. And they, I, I was given a prednisone injection and steroid cream, which mm -hmm. helped to clear it up. And I'm starting to get these sores again. And I don't want to keep taking prednisone or even the steroid cream, but I don't know what to do. Got it. Now, question, um, before you had this autoimmune, was there anything that, that occurred uh, right before that that may have triggered that? Well, to, to be honest with you, I've also got RA and hypothyroidism. And yes, um, my mother lives with me. I have three brothers that I have to help um, do shopping for. None of them are driving. So I've got a lot on my plate. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah. Okay. So yeah, because there's always something that uh, kind of triggered. It sounds like the stress is really high. So um, one thing that you can do um, is start taking something that kind of mimics prednisone, but that has very virtually no side effects and that would be the vitamin d in higher amounts vitamin d3 in higher amounts i would make sure you take the k2 with it and magnesium because it'll work better um the other thing that you can do is probably ashwagandha would be a very good herb for you and uh some natural b1 uh that will actually reduce the stress so then your immune system can get back into uh, alignment from what what's happening with that but um yeah, because you, because you, we need to get rid of the inflammation, the, the slippery slope with these steroids or the prednisone. Wow, that um, that can affect your weight. It affects everything else. So I do understand. I took steroids, prednisone, every year for I don't know how many years because I had poison ivy every single year. Had to take it, and to the point where it didn't work anymore. So um, that created a lot of damage in my body. Um, so uh, luckily I'm not, I haven't gotten it this year, but um, the point is that uh, that prednisone just makes your adrenals very, very weakened. And then one last thing that I think will benefit you is the whole desiccated adrenal. Um, I'm not biased with my own adrenal product, but you're taking these uh, glandulars that definitely it's kind of like a, a, it's like a stronger um, approach against this problem to really support the adrenals and give it what it needs to kind of function. Okay, we'll have at well, that. I'm already taking 30,000 D3 and K2. Okay. For the last eight months. So. Okay, then you need to. Uh, um, and it's taking care of the RA. I'm not on no okay. RA medication. Good. Then I would I would uh, continue that, but I would also add the B, B1 and then as well as the uh, ashwagandha. And then also. Um, I take Make that sure too. that you have a oh good. Make sure you have a really good probiotic, and do whatever you can to um, lessen the stress situation. I know you'll probably have to do regular type of aerobic exercise to get more um, flushing of the cortisol out of your body and, and the adrenaline. But um, um, you know, you're you're kind of sounds like you're stuck between a rock and a hard place, and um, that's a, not a good place to be. Um, for your stress. So that kind of keeps you, you know, so anything you could do to improve that environment would be therapeutic to your adrenals. 
All right, that's great. Well, listen, thank you so much, Karen, and love to hear back from you on to your progress. And if you want to reduce your stress, just watch Dr. Burke. He's so mellow. And he's even mellow off the camera. He doesn't throw things around as soon as we go off the air. He's just very relaxed, and I think it must be his diet. All right, let's move on uh, to um, another question. Let's see. Oh, no, we didn't answer this one. Okay, uh, I'm going to get with it, folks. What is the most potent way to increase a growth of brain cells, specifically in Terry, our producer? And the audience, um, uh, 45% of them say fasting. I agree. 45% say exercise, 5% say more sleep, and 5% say reduce sugar intake. Well, everyone's correct, but there is one very, very potent trigger, and that is exercise. Mm. Exercise. Uh, and then, um, you know, exercise, um, if you think about um, what exercise does, it's like back when when people you know um we had to hunt for our foods and things like that uh we were exercising a little bit more right steve indeed um, i mean we literally had to be running constantly so our bodies have adapted to that to the point where uh, if we didn't have food thus fasting uh we would and it was cold out and all these other things you would have to um make sure your brain is sharp uh you couldn't have brain fog so or else you would die you wouldn't survive so all the ancestors where your body has come from have um, survived from this adaptation and this, um, this mental acuity that occurs when you exercise and when you starve your body or fast, and uh, especially even like cold therapy too. So all these things can be beneficial to your brains. And, um, but if we reverse that and we have a sedentary life and uh, we car you know, eat constantly, and always have food around us and the all you can eat buffet. And Steve, this might be shocking to you, but you know, you food is available even 24 seven. There's places you can go to that are open that you can get food even in the grocery store around the clock. Stop so, it. Um, I know, I know it's hard to believe, but uh, we no longer have the uh, problem of food, but um, now we have the opposite problem. Wow. All right, everybody keep that Refrigerator door closed. All right, Tony from Facebook, which is better for controlling cholesterol, non-flush or full-flush niacin? Is that a thing? Yeah, yeah, you want the flush for cholesterol. In fact, if you don't have the flush, if you have the non-flush, it won't work uh, for your cholesterol problem. It works for other things. So if you really want to control, uh, in a very powerful way, your cholesterol, niacin, the regular flushing type, is the an most awesome remedy out there. Okay, we need to help uh, Ann, who's coming to us from Facebook. I have MCAS, I'm on keto, I'm dairy-free, and I'm on any inflammatory diet. Help, I feel like I can't eat anything. N-E-A-S? Sorry, uh, uh, M-C, as in Charlie, A-S. M-C-A-S. Okay, and what does that stand for? Well... I don't know. I tell you what, Ann, if you would, you know, expand on that a little bit instead of the acronym or whatever that is, uh, we will get back with you. But we're stumped with MCAS. All right, let's move on until Ann writes back. Uh, let's see. Ramesh from Facebook sounds like a vegetarian. How can I get, uh, how can vegetarian, excuse me, he is one, get the right amount of B12? You know, plants uh, do not create B12, um, but microbes do. And uh, believe it or not, and I'm not bragging on this, but our, our wheatgrass juice powder, we just, we found out it was like twice, twice the values of, of, our, our, uh, of B12 because it's microbial rich and it's not sterilized, it's raw. Um, but typically, um, just to play it safe, you're going to have to take... Uh, B12 as a supplement. Um, and the type you really want is the methylcobalamin, not the cyanocobalamin. You want the natural type of B12. But, um, you know, it's, it's funny about um, vegetables and actually what how they get their nutrition. Um, mostly they get it from eating bacteria. 
okay? They eat bacteria. And then in that bacteria, that's where they extract the nutrition. So a lot of people don't know that. It's kind of a new thing um, <clears throat> to know. But uh, believe it or not, apparently plants are not vegan. <laughs> they eat bacteria. Interesting. Who knew? Okay, here's our next question. All right, what is the best... Um, exercise to increase the growth of the brain cell. I think we covered that. Um, you want to tell, you want to, well, we already covered that. Do you have another question, Steve? Oh, did we really? I'm Later. sorry. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. We, we, oh, I'm sorry. This is a, we did not answer this. Um, what type of exercise? That's what, that's what this should be. Ah. Should we do to increase the growth of your brain cells? Not what should we do? It's, now we're talking about the type out of all the different types, what would be the best to do to, to get more brain cells? Okay, and Terry, I'm not picking on you. I'm concerned for you. I want you to listen up on this. We'll get you uh, into the proper mode for that. Uh, and let's move along back to, um, oh, Leslie from YouTube. This sounds awful. I would like to know what I can do to reduce or heal scar tissue in the lungs. Can't imagine what happened to her. Well, you know, there's obviously been inflammation that then led to scar tissue. And one of the best ways to inhibit fibrosis in the lungs is the tocotrienols. Tocotrienols, that'll also reduce uh, scar tissue in your liver too. It's a type of vitamin E, newly discovered um, um, other part of the vitamin E complex. I wouldn't get the mix with the tocopherols. I would just get the only, like the mixed tocotrienols, that's it. Not with the added to cofferels because they do compete and it's just, it's more powerful. It's more powerful than the regular tocotrinos. And uh, especially if you have fibrosis in the lung. And of course, um, there's other things you can do too, like that Sarah, uh, I think it's Sarah peptase uh, enzyme that also works, but I would start with the vitamin E and go from there. All right. Very good. Uh, Savita from uh, Facebook has a question. Uh, he's lost too much weight with healthy keto, if there's such a thing, which has a negative impact on my looks. Please address my problem. Well, that, that is a real problem, isn't it? Can be. People would kill for that problem, but it is a problem. And so what you're going to have to do is you're going to have to somehow maintain that two meal a day, but increase the, the calories. You're going to have to increase the calories, uh, increase more fat calories, uh, workout, um, harder so you could maintain the uh, muscle and stimulate muscle growth. Uh, that's really the solution. Um, you know, yeah, you might be doing the 10 cups of salad, but there's not a lot of calories in that. So you're going to have to add, you know, a, maybe a little bit more protein, a little more, uh, actually and a lot more fat. That's what I would do. And that way your body will at least at the very minimum, um, not tap into your own fat reserve. It will actually, um, use, it'll use, your ketones will come from the dietary uh, fat that you're eating. Okay, very good. Let's uh, wrap it up with our last great contestant from the green room. This is Karen from uh, Fort Worth, Texas. I'm going to unmute her, and she's now going to ask her one question of you, Dr. Burr. Go ahead, Karen. Karen, can you hear us? Go ahead. You're on with Dr. Burr. Oh, oh, oh dear. Uh, Karen, we can't hear you for some reason, so I'm going to put you back on pause for a second. And if you would, maybe oh, I, I what I see, I see there's a uh, a mute button on her end. Um, so if she could click that, I think that there she goes. Now say something, Karen. Okay, can you hear me now? I can't hear yes. Steve, but I can hear you. Okay. okay, great. I can hear you perfectly. Okay, great. Uh, so thank you for being on your show. I appreciate it. Um, I am a 65 year old, very healthy woman. Um, I have been doing intermittent fasting naturally practically in my whole life. Um, mm. when intermittent fasting became a thing, it was like, Oh, that's what I do. Um, mm. and, uh, my question to you is, is that I always have high cholesterol. It's very high. And, um, you know, I've read a lot about, you know, listening to your um, talks about good cholesterol, that cholesterol is produced when something is deficient in your body, so it needs the cholesterol. 
And so I go into this debate with my doctor, you know, and they say, well, you need to uh, exercise. You need to reduce fatty foods, stop fried foods. All of that doesn't, is not relevant to me because I eat healthy. I exercise. I'm at an ideal weight. Mm -hmm. And so the doctor wanted me to go get a CT scan to, they have a new one that can look at the arteries to see if they're blocked. Mm -hmm. And when I, I can't go on statins cause it, it hurts my body, but I have taken a drug called Repatha that is a non, uh, statin drug and that controls my cholesterol. So my question to you is being a healthy woman, you know, my age and I'm, if I'm off of any kind of drugs, it's way up there. So right. what is your take on all of this like did, should did i they, get on this pack on it or did they do they do a test to, to show that you have a hereditary uh cholesterol problem is that is it right in the family well, or do they do it? i think it's hereditary um but they didn't do its test specifically to see if it's hereditary is there a specific okay. test that they can do for that yeah yeah they can determine and just rule that out because let's let's pretend that it is because um you're eating healthy and you still have high cholesterol. I'm, I'm guessing you have high levels of total cholesterol or is it uh, more LDL or, or what's any more information on that? Yes. So I'm like, um, let me look. Uh, I think I have it in here. I can tell it quickly. Um, I think it's around... Well, ask me another question and I can look it up real quick. Yeah. So did you have high triglycerides? Yes. Okay. Did you have high LDL? Yes. Okay. Did they ever do an advanced lipid profile where they looked at uh, the particle size of the LDL? That's what you need. No. That's what you need because that would give us a lot of great information because we're looking for is it a pattern A or pattern B? And basically we're looking at the difference between the small dense uh, LDL versus the large buoyant LDL. Those are, um, it, it, chances are when they do that, they're going to find that you have uh, the majority is going to be the large buoyant um, LDL, which is non-pathogenic. So um, that would be a very, very important Another test to be really, really important is um, to do a DNA, DNA test to, to see if there's any problems with this gene called APO, APOE, okay? And you want to know if it's a APOE 2, 3, or 4. And um, you want it to be like 3 or 2. You don't want it to be 4. If it's a 4, then that could be more of a risk factor of other issues. So that's just an additional test. Did they do the CAC test, the, the coronary artery calcification test yet? I haven't done that yet. I have that scheduled. So that's a good you test. Think that that's a good test. Yeah, that's a good test. Cause that's going to look at calcium uh, buildup. I, I mean, if you're eating healthy, I think that'll be low, but it'll give you a good, um, it's even, a, it's a better indication than even the cholesterol test. So I would get the advanced lipid profile to look at those particle sizes and then, um, is that I'm, a blood test? Yes. Yeah. And the thing okay. is that, um, you know, here you are eating healthy and, you, and you, maybe you probably feel healthy and then you get in a drug and you probably don't feel healthy. So of course I'm, I'm, i I would just do natural ways to lower cholesterol. For example, natal kinase is a natural remedy. Uh, red rice extract is a natural cholesterol remedy. Niacin is a natural cholesterol remedy. These are things that virtually have no side effect, but they, they act like a statin. Um, so, and then maybe you just don't add additional um, fat to what's already coming with the meal and then reevaluate because um, I think, I think you're 65, very healthy person. And uh, you probably have a hereditary factor. And in which case you need to kind of, uh, drill down on a couple other things um, that other people don't have to do. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Berg. You're welcome.
Well, Karen, we hope you come back with us after you've, you know, tried some of these things because it's, uh, it's a shame you work so hard at staying healthy and then you have this uh, buggy thing. So please do get back in touch with us and uh, let us know how that is all going uh, and keep up the great example. Okay, let's uh, hit another question. There you go, Dr. Berg. Okay, so what is the best fuel for preventing seizures? All right, climb on it, audience. Let's see. Junior Joe, uh, is cod liver oil uh, for reducing inflammation? Uh, it's, it's, one of the, it's one of the best because it's omega-3. Plus, it gives you the added benefit that goes beyond like the fish oils with, by giving you vitamin A and vitamin D. So you get the omega-3, DHA, EPA, and the vitamin A and the vitamin D all together in one package. So your grandmother was correct by giving you this cod liver oil uh, spoonful each day um they knew back then um so it's a really good good source of omega-3 fatty acids and uh you know i i consume a lot of cod liver oil um steve have you ever had the um cod liver in the can the wild caught cod liver in a can yet i wouldn't touch it with a tin it sounds gross no i think you would and in really? fact you'd you would like it it's it's uh doesn't even taste like liver and it's kind of like the consistency of pudding huh and it's quite delicious cod liver in a can it's kind of like another sardine but way higher in omega-3 and um i wouldn't necessarily at the first time eat the whole thing because <clears throat> it's a lot of it's a lot of fat but maybe half of it um it's quite it's quite good and you can get it very easily online and um, um it's uh, wild caught usually Huh. Well, I'll, I'll give it a shot. And uh, by the way, Ann got back with us. MCAS is mast, M-A-S-T, mast cell activation syndrome. Ever heard of that? Mm -hmm. uh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I got it. And then what did she have? What did she want to know about that? <clears throat> Let me go back up there. Um, uh, she said, I'm on keto, I'm dairy free, and I'm on an anti-inflammatory diet. Help. I feel like I can't eat anything because of that condition. Well, I think um, <clears throat> that quercetin would be a good thing to take as a supplement. And of course, the onions would be good too. Um, and then also, um, you know, since we have this immune issue, um, you need to beef up, no pun intended, your vitamin D and the zinc to probably the most important nutrients for the immune system. Um, but I would uh, start taking more of each of those right now. Okay, very good. Uh, quiz number four. This audience is so smart and so fast. What is the best fuel for preventing seizures? And 85% uh, of respondents say ketones or healthy fats. 10% say MCT and 5% say coconut oil. Well, I think everyone's uh, saying the same thing indirectly, but it's, uh, it's ketones. And that can come from coconuts or MCT oil, but the ketones are uh, very interesting because this fuel particle has a way of bypassing one of the hallmarks for neuron damage, which is um, an inability for that nerve cell to take on glucose anymore because they have abused it. They've eaten so many carbs and more, so many sugar sugars that it created this resistance into the blood-brain barrier. So now they can't get the fuel to the neurons and it dies. It's you shrink, you shrink. So, but guess what? Ketones come in there at the, as a rescue. Uh, they can feed the neurons directly, regardless of how much damage you have from the sugar. They can also act as an antioxidant and anti-inflammatory. They provide the neurons for more ATP and energy. So it really is the ultimate solution, um, especially for people that are epileptic or have seizures. And um, unfortunately though, um, some of the children that have epilepsy, um, you know, they're, they're put on a ketogenic diet that I would say is not uh, too healthy. It's um, a lot of times they, it's like liquid fat and, um, you know, these recipes, I'm like, I, I, I couldn't eat that. There's even like a, it's called a keto kale. It's like a canned um, thing for these kids that gives a lot of fat and uh but the quality is crappy it's vegetable oils but they're not looking at the 
the quality of ingredients. And uh, it's not just about the, these macros. It's about um, the ingredients. That's like way more important and not way more important, but it's just as important. So um, no wonder uh, there's not a lot of kids that can stick to this program for very long because it's pretty disgusting. Okay, very good. Well, our producer, Terry, got back at me. He said, hey, genius, how about giving them the answer to question number three, which I didn't do, which ironically says, what's the best exercise for uh, brain cells? Touche, Terry. You got me on that one. <laughs> anyway, uh, he's going to forgive me. Yeah, he, I know he's doing a victory lap on that one. On you. Yeah, it is. But here's what they all said. 70% of our respondents say sprinting or high-intensity exercise 20% say weight training and 10% say yoga. Okay, well, you know, you could be right depending on the intensity, but aerobic exercise, aerobic exercise. So, yes, it is true that uh, this anaerobic uh, high intensity is really good for other things and many great things, so you should do it. But the aerobic exercise where you're actually, you know, you're, you're doing maybe a fast-paced walk with a lot of breathing, maintaining a little lower cortisol and stress hormone, um, maybe like a bike or a jog, that's actually really, really good for your brain. So I like to, I recommend doing a combination because if you're going to truly do a high intensity workout, you should get sore, right? And then you should have rest the next day unless you switch your workouts. Um, so I always like to mix it up. In fact, I don't even mix it up. I, I, I pretty much do aerobic every single day and then I do Several times a week, I do the anaerobic, which is um, higher intensity stuff. But that aerobic is very, very therapeutic to your brain. And um, you should just get out there and start walking and getting more oxygen if you want more brain cells. <clears throat> Steve. <laughs> very good. Well, I'm jogging in place now, uh, now trying to get that effect. Um, but it's slow to come. So Sharon from Facebook, my friend has bad neuropathy in her feet. That hurts. Mm -hmm. Please help her. Uh, with any advice you could offer that's a very easy one uh chances are it's coming from a high carb diet which in case you need to get off the carbs but to to turn things around fast you take a product called benfotamine okay benfotamine um and whatever i would just take four of those a day spread them out and if you wanted to just add one more little uh, thing to it to speed things up uh, alpha lipoic acid is another good one for this. So the combination of both of those will be um, a no brainer to help support these nerves and uh, uh, get the myelin sheath back uh, to where it should be. Okay, very good. Our final question, this one, a true false sir. All right, true or false. UV as an ultraviolet radiation has anti-inflammatory properties. I'm really putting you on the spot here, audience. We've got about a minute and a half left or something. So uh, knock that out. In the meantime, Doc, let's see. Do we talk about how exciting it is for people not in the contiguous United States to be able to get your products affordably? Yeah, we're working on that to expand. I think uh, we've, we're have we getting into India, I think, uh, pretty soon. If not, we're already there. But um, if you click down below and you'll find a better way to kind of avoid the excessive shipping it would be to ship uh, overseas from america okay very good let me find another question while we're waiting for the answer uh let's see Ooh, now uh, and come on and from facebook it's hard to swallow your nutritional yeast tablets um you know and i'm telling you and crunch them up eat those suckers you, you I chew them. I chew them. Um, yeah. But yes, I understand. Then you can just get the powder. We have the flakes. You can just put that on your salad. Uh, it's pretty actually, has a nice flavor. I like it. And it's non-fortified, so it doesn't have these synthetic things. 30% uh, of the population has a um, genetic problem with folic acid. And so if they're going to get these synthetic versions of the B vitamins, like folic acid instead of, of, of folate, or the synthetic ver version of the B12, they're going to have a lot of problems. So uh, it's going to build up as a toxic type thing. But if you get the nutritional yeast without that, you're good. You don't have to worry about it. Um, this is why some people have reactions to nutritional yeast because they're doing the fortified version. Um, but before we answer this last question, Steve, as you're getting your thoughts together, I would like to survey you at home. And um, we're going to be... Um, 
kind of introducing like a new channel and I'm growing your own food, super healthy food. Um, and what I'm interested in is to know uh, if you are interested in that, number one, and number two, why? What is the reason you would be interested in growing your own food? I mean, is it you're trying to just eat, find healthier food, save money? What would be your reason for doing that? If you could comment down below, that would be great. Just so I, I know um, like um, your intention behind learning how to grow food right inside your house. Well, Lori and I are really excited since you brought that up. I mean, you know, the old victory garden that they used to have during World War II when times were tough. Well, guess what? Inflation and everything. Very excited. And plus just you bragging about the benefits of soil and how much a difference that can make, uh, especially, you know, as, as opposed to hydroponic or all that stuff. So, I mean, I think there's people that are giddy about it. We certainly are. I can't wait to start my uh, Dr. Berg victory garden. Well, the audience has come through with their lightning fast answer true false uv radiation has anti-inflammatory properties and 99 percent say true and there's one holdout who says false be great if he was right you know when you think about uv radiation everyone's trying to avoid it right because it's um it's going to cause melanomas and sunburn and um all sorts of problems but it does have an anti-inflammatory effect it does. And it's, this is why they're using it even as a therapy for like psoriasis, eczema and uh, dermatitis and, and um, even vitiligo, which is um, lack of pigment on your skin. So it's, uh, I'm going to create a video on the, the benefits of UV radiation, which I think you're going to find quite fascinating. I'll also be talking about the difference between like UVA versus B versus C. So you really understand it in a simple way and how it interacts with your, your body. And this goes way beyond just the conversion of um, the vitamin, I mean, the UV to, to vitamin D3. There's other benefits that go beyond the vitamin D connection. So with that note, I appreciate your attention, your wonderful comments. Uh, I will see you next week and also tomorrow with another video on the YouTube channel.